Hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. And behold, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. He said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He answered, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answered, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked, And who is my neighbor? Jesus said, A man was walking along the road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was set upon by robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was walking along the road, and when he saw the man, passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to the place where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he placed him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, where he cared for him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and if you spend any more, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who was set upon by robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. Amen? Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome. My name is Carolyn Kester. I'm a wife of Josh, mother of two little boys, and I've been teaching the high schoolers here at Imani on Wednesday nights. Um, also extend the welcome to anyone worshiping with us online. Thank you for joining us. February is the month of love, right? We had Valentine's Day last week. Did ever, anybody here celebrate Valentine's Day? Maybe with your husband, your wife, took them to a nice dinner, uh, got them flowers or card, your significant other. You know, maybe your kids had to bring Valentine's to share. My son took some to preschool to share with his class, right? Uh, so love is in the air during the month of February. And as you know, Pastor Joshua is out of town this week. He and his wife are in Tanzania. Um, they arrived safely. We're um, praying for them as they're there. Uh, but before he left, he asked me if I would talk this morning on the subject of loving God and loving community. Loving God and loving community. Uh, February is a good time to talk about love, but this is a subject that applies to every day of the year. So we're going to return to this parable that Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan, and we'll look at some other scripture as well. But as I talk up here this morning, I want you all to be thinking about a couple of questions for your own lives. The first one is, why do I live in the place where I live? And number two, is my presence in that place making life better for those around me? When Pastor first asked me to talk on this subject this morning, I could see the hand of God in it because he didn't know it at the time, but Josh and I have just moved, or we just purchased, we're in process of moving, to a new house, right? So I've been thinking about community a lot. Uh, this is just over two weeks ago. We uh, closed on this house. We've been painting, cleaning. My mother-in-law is here this morning. has been invaluable help uh, doing painting projects. We're making it the way we want it. We are... Uh, before this, we've always rented, right? This is the very first house that we bought. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Josh and I are celebrating our seventh anniversary this year. So in the time since we've been married, we've moved five times now. So we've lived in two different, city, yeah, two different states, three different cities, and five different places that we've called home. But this is the first time that we're putting down roots, right? We're going to stay here for a while. This is the first house we've owned rather than just lived in. And so since it's 
it's not just a place to live, it's also an investment, right? I won't tell you how much our house cost, but I will tell you it cost a lot more than we had in our savings account, right? So what do we do? Well, we took out a loan for a good chunk of money, promising that we'd eventually pay it back, right? Uh, and that won't happen overnight. It's going to take us many years to fully pay for this house. So we've committed to be in this home for the long haul. We invested in this house. If we decide it isn't working for us, we can't just do like we've done before, given a 30-day notice and pack up and leave, right? It's not going to work like that. So before we handed over that much money, we wanted to be as sure as possible that this was the right house for us. We didn't want this to be a mistake. So how do we decide that this is the house we want to buy? Well, for starters, we made a list of wants and needs. Uh, you know, uh, something that is a good size for a family of four, a little bit of yard for the boys to play in. Uh, it's got to have a garage because Josh needs some workshop space. You know, and some natural light would be nice. So we took this list to our realtor. And he read through our, our desires and said, okay, I think this is a good list. You know, we can find something that fits your budget that, that is like this. Um, so before we start you know, pulling up some suggestions, where exactly do you want to live? You know, what neighborhood are you looking at? And Josh and I kind of looked at each other and we said, oh, you know, wherever is fine. You know, not too far from the Des Moines metro. You've got family in Urbandale. You know, we want to be close to them. Uh, Josh works remotely, so commute isn't really a problem. Um, we're open to looking anywhere at this point. And our realtor, who also happens to be family, uh, kind of sat us down and said, okay, Josh, Carolyn, uh, I really need you to narrow down what community you want to live in. And we can find the home of your dreams, but where you choose to live is going to make as much difference to your happiness as the house itself. I don't just want you to love your house. I want you to love your community. Why do you live in the place where you live? This morning, I want to introduce you to a character from the Bible who was very intentional about choosing her community. Her name was Ruth. She has a whole book named after her. It's only four chapters long, but still a whole book of the Bible dedicated to the story of Ruth. The book opens with a statement that during this time, there was a famine in Israel. And a certain Israelite family, uh, a woman named Naomi, her husband and their two sons, traveled to the neighboring uh, area of Moab to find relief from the famine. And while they're there, their two sons take Moab Moabite wives. Their names are Ruth and Orpah. And they live happily there for some time. But then Naomi's husband dies and both her sons die as well, leaving all three women widows. So Naomi decides to return to her homeland, to the land of Israel, and she encourages her daughters-in-law to go back to their families as well. Orpah and Ruth, remember, were not Israelites, they were Moabites from Moab, and after much convincing, Orpah decides to leave. She goes back, she leaves Naomi, and goes back to her family in Moab. But Ruth refuses to go. So Naomi says to her in Ruth 1, verse 15, and she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return with your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Well, clearly in the years that they've lived together in the land of Moab, Naomi has made an impression on Ruth. Ruth makes the decision to leave the community that she was born into, her family, the places and customs that she knew, in order to follow her mother-in-law into a new community. For whatever reason, Ruth is dead set on relocating to Israel. And that's where she wants to live. Those are the people that she wants to live with, the God that she wants to serve. And the Lord blesses her decision and her faithfulness to Naomi. 
In fact, Ruth, this Moabite woman, is the great-grandmother of King David of Israel, who is also in the family line of Jesus. So what does the story of Ruth have to teach us about loving our community? Well, before we go any further, I want to clarify some terms. Just like the lawyer asked Jesus to clarify who is my neighbor, let's be clear what we mean when we ask who is my community. Well, according to Google, the word community is used to describe a group of people living in the same place or having a certain characteristic in common. A group of people living in the same place or having characteristics in common. At its most basic level, your family is a community, right? You're together, you have things in common. Your community includes your church. I believe Pastor Noel is going to talk more about that next week. It includes your workplace and the people that you interact with there. And finally, your community refers to your physical neighborhood, the people who live near you and the businesses, um, structures, governments that support those people. In other words, your community is the people and all the people that you live your life alongside. From your next door neighbor to the owner of the cafe down the street to the homeless person that you drive past on your way to work. If you see them on a regular basis, they are part of your community. Another way to think, of it, uh, think about this is that your community, the people in your community, are the neighbors that God intends for you to love. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus answers that question, who is my neighbor, not with geographical boundaries, but with a statement that your neighbor is anyone that you have mercy on. It's anybody that you choose to love. And therefore, your neighbor could be anyone and everyone, right? We're commanded to love everyone in the world. But when we think about it in such broad terms, those implications can be so overwhelming that they lose some power of practical application. Sure, you know, I love everyone. I'm a Christian. Uh, I, I'm kind to all people. But is a positive feeling toward everybody all that God requires of us when he asks us to love our neighbor. When our realtor said, I want you to love your community, he meant it in terms of positive feelings for the most part, right? I want you to enjoy the place that you live in. I want it to be a place you're proud to live in, a place that you like spending time in, that has the amenities that you want. But when Jesus says, love your community, he expects more from us than a feeling of appreciation for the place that we live in. He expects our love for our communities to be expressed as action. The author and theologian C.S. Lewis had this to say about loving your neighbor. He said, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. Love is a conscious choice expressed in tangible ways. Like the choice Ruth made to be part of the community of Israel and to express that love by caring for her mother-in-law. If I'm to show love to my neighbor through my actions, I need to identify the specific, specific neighbors that I personally am called to help. And that is where community comes in. We were talking last Wednesday night uh, with the high schoolers about how we spend so much time on our phones, uh, and specifically on social media. And I tried to feel out what they were thinking. You know, why, why do you think social media is so attractive? And overwhelmingly, they gave the answer, well, um, when I post on social media, it makes me feel known. When I see people liking my things, uh, looking at my, my feed, my pictures, whatever I'm posting, it makes me feel connected to these people, like they know who I am, and like I know who they are. So are our friends on social media, the people who follow us, are they part of our community? Well, if your Facebook friends list is anything like mine, uh, most of the people I'm supposedly friends with are not people that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, very, very few of them even live in the same town. I've not seen a lot of them in a long while. 
It may seem with, I'm, that I'm connected to these people, but in reality, if something happens to me, if I found myself needing help, very few of them are going to be able to do anything about it. Proverbs 27, verse 10 says, Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. God has intended us to be there for the people that we coexist with in our neighborhood, at our workplace, in our day-to-day -day lives. The reason we have neighborhoods is to help each other out. I preached a sermon a few months ago with the title, We Need Each Other, and talked about a very similar thing. If people didn't need other people, we could all just live off by ourselves and do our own thing. But the truth is that God has created us to be for others. God's plan for every one of us is that we live our, live our life in connection with other people. And we show our love for God by leaning into that plan. We love God by loving the people we do life with. By providing for them, caring for them, working hard as though working directly for God himself. And that's how you love your community with your actions. The Bible is full of commands to us as Christians to be an active part of the communities we live in. Here are just a few. Philippians 2.4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Romans 12.16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Jesus says of his disciples in John 17.18, He's talking to God at first. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And this powerful statement in Galatians 5.14 that echoes the lesson we learn in the parable of the Good Samaritan. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. I would be a pretty poor Christian if I bought a house simply for the house itself and never stepped out my front door. We're commanded to love our community because in doing so, we show our love for God. Because God has placed you in the community and the communities you are a part of for a reason. You are in your community to fulfill a need, something he has planned for you to do, some role that only your skill set and your experience can accomplish. I'd like to remind you of another Old Testament story by way of an example. Way back in the book of Genesis, we find the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph was one of 12 brothers, and you may recall those brothers did not like him very much at all. Uh, in fact, they disliked him so much that they sold him into slavery and told their father that he had been killed by a wild animal. So here's Joseph, taken to the land of Egypt against his will. Suddenly, and through no choice of his own, Joseph's community is drastically different. You know, the people he's doing life with are completely changed. So what happens next? In Genesis 39, verses 2 and 4, we read, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he, his master, made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Unlike Ruth, who chose to go to the community that she wanted, Joseph was forced to serve a community and in a capacity that he had never imagined. When he found himself in this new place, new people, new customs, he had two choices. First, he could have tried to hold on to the life that he had before or dreamed of something better and held on to that dream instead. He could have prayed that God would save him from that present predicament and done his best in the meantime to remain separate from the Egyptians and their way of life. We do this sometimes when we don't love the communities that we're part of in the way our realtor meant it, right? When we plan uh, to only be in our current situation for a short time or as short a time as possible. We think to ourselves, I'm living here now, I'm working at this company for the moment, but as soon as I'm able to, I'm going to go somewhere else. 
I'm not going to spend any effort making a difference in this community because I'd rather invest my energy somewhere else. I'd rather be involved in the things out there that really matter. I'd rather get to know the people that can actually do things, that can make a difference, the right people. I remember hearing this mentality in college a lot uh, from my friends who never got connected to a local church. Some of them would say, well, I'm only going to be here for four years. You know, I'm going home every summer. It's really not worth it to try and build those relationships with a church when they're not going to last beyond college. But Joseph didn't take that perspective. Instead, he chose to believe that the place where he found himself now was where God wanted him to be. That God had a plan for his time in Egypt, however hard it might be, however long it might last. He put his best effort into his new role and worked for the good of his new community. That's a hard calling, isn't it? To love the community we're in, even if we'd rather be somewhere else. But because of Joseph's faithfulness, God grants him success. And the community in which he started out as a slave ends up promoting him to be second in command of the nation, second only to Pharaoh himself. We see almost the same thing happen many years later in the book of Daniel. This is after the land of Israel has been conquered by their enemies, the Babylonians, and many Israelites are taken to Babylon into service. And among the captives are four young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You might know the later ones as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They had a run-in with a fiery furnace a bit later on. But listen to these words in Daniel, Genoa chapter 1, starting in verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. Once again, instead of clinging to that idea of a community they'd lost, of using their gifts and talents in a different place, these young men put their skills to work for the good of the new community they found themselves in. And here's the crazy thing about that. Babylon was Israel's enemy, right? They had just conquered the land of Israel. And the, one, the king that Daniel and the others served, he did not recognize, believe in, or honor the one true God. And yet still they sought the good of the land that they were in. It's a little confusing, isn't it? And because they sought to build up rather than to tear down, they gained more and more favor and were entrusted with more and more power. See, when you love your community well, even those who don't believe in God will see his hand through your service. Even if they don't understand that it's God, they'll recognize that there is something special about you and the way that you live. You know, some, of the, some of you maybe hear these stories about Joseph and Daniel and the others, and you think, oh, I could never do that. I'm not brave enough to be a leader. You know, I, even if God grants me favor in the eyes of my community, I wouldn't know what to do with that sort of influence. I don't feel comfortable reaching out to my neighbors because I don't think I can handle the pressure of having to respond to their needs all on my own. You know, but God never asks us to do anything all on our own, right? He is right there alongside us, and he provides others to serve alongside us too. You're not called to fix the problems of your community all by yourself. Maybe you're feeling burnout because you've been trying to fill a need that someone else is better suited to fill. Maybe God has planned a different role for you. you know, many communities already have a lot of structure in place for the good of their people, right? There's homeless shelters, food banks, uh, organizations that help with youth. You know, if you can't find a place to serve all by yourself and create something from nothing, get involved in the good that's already there. Be a presence and a light for God in those structures where that is already taking place. I had another insight last Wednesday night. The high schoolers and I uh, were discussing whether it's better to be a leader or a follower. And Rashid, who's co-leading with me, 
he uh, said something that stuck with me. He said, not all of us are called to be leaders, but all of us are called to be an example. When I was in high school, I spent three summers working at the local theater in my hometown, uh, acting in plays, learning uh, how to make costumes, build sets, all the tricks of the trade. And they would bring in other professional actors and other um, craftsmen who did this for a living. They'd bring them into the theater from out of town for the few who were. And although faith and Jesus did come up naturally in conversations a few times, I was never act actively trying to evangelize them during my time there. But I'll never forget what one of these professional actors said to me once after a summer of working together. Just out of the blue, we were talking about something else, and she suddenly said, you know, you have a light inside you. I don't know what it is, but you keep shining that light. Philippians 2.15 says, you shine as lights in the world. Chances are, God will not raise you up to be second in command in the nation. But if he does, or he does ask, rather, that in whatever community you find yourself, you live as an example to others. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.13, Let no one look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Set an example so that your light may shine before others. Now let's be honest, this is easier said than done. Sometimes people just rub you the wrong way, right? Or some can be overly hostile toward you. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, I've tried to be good to my neighbors, to show love to them, but they just don't want it. Or maybe they've repaid some kindness with evil. So how do you deal with bad neighbors while still living as an example of the love of Christ? Well, let me ask you another question. For those people in your communities, your workplace, your neighborhood, even your family, that you find hardest to love, how well do you really know them? Have you taken the time to get to know them? Before we can love someone well, we have to spend time with them, listen to their stories, and in doing so, we begin to truly discern where their needs lie and how we can best respond to those needs. Let's think back to that parable of the Good Samaritan. How many of us, like the priest, like the Levite, seeing a man lying half dead on the side of the road, would have walked by on the other side? Well, I hope not many of us. You know, hopefully inspired by the compassion of the Holy Spirit, we would rush to his aid. Well, why is that? Well, we can see he is very clearly in need, right? There is a man on the side of the road. He's dying. Uh, he needs medical attention. He needs some clothes. He needs a place to stay and someone to help him. I can, I can be that help. But a lot of times, the needs in our community are not quite so apparent, especially in a culture that tells us we need to hide our baggage, we need to not let anyone see us struggle. It can be hard to know where our neighbors actually need our help. It's one of the reasons that I'm so excited for these home groups starting up, yes? Anyone else? I'm, I, you know, I'm going to one today. I'm excited to get to know my neighbors a little bit more because we can get to know those who are part of our community in the church who are also part of our geographic communities and we can better understand how to serve the needs of our specific communities together. Here are these words from James 127. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. When the Bible talks about widows and orphans, it's talking about those who cannot help themselves. So who are the widows and orphans in your community? Who are those who are incapable of caring for themselves? And what steps are you taking to get to know them? As I conclude today's message, I want to leave you with this final word of caution as you think about how God intends for you to love your community. Take care that you show your love to all people equally, and not only to those who can love you back. Listen to Jesus' teaching in Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36. This is New English translation. 
If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to be repaid, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners so that they may be repaid in full. But love your enemies and do good and lend and expect nothing back. Just like that good Samaritan, right? He lent not only of his money to pay for the, the inn and the care for this man, he lent his time. He came back the next day to check on this man. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to ungrateful and evil people. Be merciful, just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. So to whom in your community do you need to extend mercy this week? Those ungrateful and evil people, do you love them the way the Father loves them? The best way to love your community is to follow the example of Christ, showing them mercy even when they don't deserve it. Remember Jesus' concluding remarks at the end of the parable. Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who was set upon by robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Amen.